Thanks very much for asking me to talk. Um, I'm going to tell you about 3D printing and innovation in medicine, um, both uh, as a user perspective, but also as someone who has more than a passing interest uh, in 3D printing. I think the first thing to say is that it isn't the future, it is actually here. There's plenty of examples where we're actually using 3D printing to help patients. Uh, anything from dental implants uh, through to prosthetics, joint replacements, um, and even artificial bone. And there's a, a myriad of, uh, of other uses. And one of the great advantages is that we can uh, make and change the design of things very quickly uh, in a way that we can't do with a hip replacement that we buy from the company. But it's, it's not all good, um, and there's a long journey. So these are some of the things that we're actually doing at the moment. Um, a lot of interest is now uh, developing around the idea of printing anatomical models. So most of the scans we're making these days are done digitally. Um, and often, uh, if the patient doesn't have fiducial markers, you can index them to bony parts so that you can add up the imaging. You can add your CT scan to your X-ray and your angiogram and create a 3D composite of the patient, uh, and you can then print an anatomical part. And it's believed that uh, these will help physicians and surgeons, and also uh, help you plan surgical operations. And I want to talk a little bit about this, because this is something that uh, is, uh, I, I, I feel is quite controversial. I think we've missed a trick. I think there are many, many more things where 3D printing can really help. But ultimately, it needs to join together. We need to think about the hospital of the future. So rather than have individual products, what we need to do is get the, uh, the doctors and the engineers and the scientists to work more closely together. So this is what I do. I, I do um, a lot of robotic heart surgery, and it's very um, technology intensive. Patients don't like uh, having operations at the best of times, and anything that you can do to them that doesn't involve making a big hole in them, they really like. So uh, there's a vast increase. We've now done over 700 of these um, hard bypass operations. Um, but we are very heavily dependent on technology. We have devices that hold the robot. Aside from the robot itself, we have devices holding all the equipment steady. Uh, as well as that, we have uh, equipment to hold the heart steady, as well as the special suturing uh, and all the monitoring that goes on. Um, and ultimately, um, what we want to do is get to the point where we can use a surgical robot to do the operations for us and possibly by the use of uh, artificial intelligence or deep learning uh, get the technology to understand what it's doing so that it can actually do it uh, by itself. One problem we came up with um, is the language barrier. If you're going to engage with healthcare professionals to help equip them to treat patients in a better way, you need to be talking the same language. Um, there are many examples of where this goes wrong. Um, one of the interesting things is um, how terms that are embedded in uh, engineering or science and medicine are used uh, with great confidence that they have a particular meaning, but across different specialities mean radically different things. So you can spend a lot of time understanding what the terms are, but we found that Probably the, the, the easiest thing is, is uh, the visual language, which starts off as a pen and paper, which is uh, the early design of something we designed. Um, but ultimately, um, CAD really allows you to share ideas. And, and uh, during the time that I was program director for surgical training in London, uh, through the School of Surgery, uh, I tried to drive the agenda very heavily that the surgical trainees should become familiar in this because it's no good using instruments that were designed 50, 60 years ago. If they want to use new instruments, they need to be able to explain what they want. And this is a, a, an ideal way of doing it. So I think if you're going to engage with people, not necessarily just doctors, but uh, any non-engineers, um, getting them into the idea of using a, a non-verbal way of communicating ideas, I think is, has worked very successfully for us. Right, anatomical printing of models. Um, this looks great on my desk, and the patients love to see it, and they think it's brilliant, but this doesn't really help me that much do a heart operation. Um, it may be extremely accurate, um, but what I can't do is manipulate it in a way that I would um, a conventional organ. 
Um, all I can do is see the outside of it. So I could print lots and lots of models um, that all fitted together, but even that becomes uh, quite a lengthy and cumbersome process. Um, and I'd like to make a suggestion that I think ultimately this will be replaced by holographic technology. If you can project the image of the heart and manipulate it in the computer without having to print it, I think you'd have a, a, a vastly more useful tool um, than, than a, a static anatomical model. I accept that um, there are some instances, particularly when you're trying to remove tumors that are near blood vessels, that having a 3D printed uh, transparent uh, anatomical uh, representation may help, but to be honest, with the quality of the 3D reconstruction and the imaging we have, it doesn't add a great deal, um, but there's a great deal of interest in this, but I, I, I think this may end up ultimately being a blind channel. What I wanted to talk about is the things, is the help that's really needed. And there are two things. The first is how uh, innovation of 3D printing can help us create the hospital of the future. These are some hard valves that we use. Some of them are metal, um, some of them are uh, biological, and they're all very expensive. They range from a few thousand pounds up to 20, 25,000 pounds. These are seriously expensive things. Some of them are made of nitinol, um, pig, all sorts of polymer. What we haven't uh, solved yet, even despite the enormous cost, um, is two things. Firstly, we haven't developed a durable valve, something that you can have for the rest of your life that doesn't require you undergoing some modification to your lifestyle. There isn't anything you can put in and forget about at the moment. In addition, these are all one si or these are all standard shapes. They're all round. They come in different sizes. What you cannot do is get a custom valve to shape someone's heart that maybe is more oval um, or irregular in size. So. I think um, in terms of the amount of, spend, uh, of expenditure the NHS has on things like heart valves and pacemakers, there is a vast amount of opportunity um, to make some improvements um, in these areas. Uh, our particular interest has been on improving the uh, surgical robot. The surgical robot is rubbish at the moment, which is why most people don't have robotic operations in the UK. Um, the, uh, the technology has advanced enormously to the point where visualization is great. I have fantastic high definition 3D video so I can see things in great detail and I can move the instruments very finely but what I don't have is any way of feeling what the instruments are doing. There is no force feedback and that tremendously limits what you can do because it's very easy to damage tissue or to snap strings or to tear things or cause bleeding. So. We are working with um, some major industry sponsors to fix that problem, um, but the instruments themselves um, are still very basic. At the moment, they just do things like cutting, stitching, and so developing a device that will allow you to throw a stitch inside um, is enormously enabling f for robotics, because at the moment, that's not something that you can do without opening the patient up. Um, and so, like many things, you start making it a decent size, so you can use it for open operations, and then ultimately you scale it down to the point where it'll pass through um, a, a port no bigger than a pen to get inside the patient so you can um, do complex things. Having had success with that, other things uh, you, you might have seen in the earlier picture, we had a device for holding the heart stable. Um, and again, the, the great advantage of having a common language and access to 3D printing is very quickly, we can move through a whole range of different prototypes to get to the, um, the one that works best. And most hospitals now have skills and simulation labs. So you can test these out in the lab very quickly and decide which one works and then take that one on and develop it further. Uh, ultimately, this was the design we came up with. And we had some fun last year because we printed it at the show. Um, and we used two different um, methods of printing and ended up making a composite. So this is the bit that sits on the heart. Um, and the metal casing on the top uh, is the support structure and there's a vacuum port and each one of these is a suction cup and you can see there's a fine network of pipes that all drain back through this hole so it allows us to apply suction to the heart so we can hold it very stable when we're doing heart operations. I don't want to talk a lot about artificial hearts because I talked a little bit about that last year. We have a, a major problem with heart failure in the UK. We have 850,000 people who are incapacitated with heart failure. 
Um, and these are people who can't leave the house. They're on home oxygen. They've had to move their bed downstairs. They can't play with their grandchildren. They can't go to work. Um, all because they have heart failure. And it, it depresses me slightly when I see people in clinic um, who, who have become desperately short of breath. And they're very worried they might have lung cancer. Um, and they have a whole load of tests and they get reassured that they don't have lung cancer, they've got heart failure. And they think, oh, thank God for that, I don't have cancer. But the sad truth of it is end-stage heart failure has probably got a worse outcome these days in the UK than um, lung cancer does. So the average survival of end-stage heart failure is only about two years. And the burden on the healthcare because of the number of days these patients spend in hospital is huge. So they're miserable and unhappy. They're not all old people. Some of them are very young. We don't have enough hearts to make transplants work um, for all of them. So the waiting list uh, is often upwards of two or even three years. So the machines that we've tried in the past with varying degrees of success, uh, unfortunately are all based on uh, major hydraulic pumps. And I think um, there is a, a way that we can improve this. We're starting to see newer designs uh, with new materials and the ability to manufacture things, making things um, that can spin at high speed, such as small turbines, are much easier to put in patients um, and work extremely well. And there are people who are even starting to try and print 3D versions of the artificial heart. So this is a huge area that I touched on last time. I personally think that if we can make even small devices that can be distributed around the body rather than one big piece of machinery inside the chest, we could be implanting these percutaneously or minimally invasively and ultimately help the patients without making a big hole in them. I talked about hospital of the future and I think that's one of the key things is that um, we spend an awful lot of time uh, trying to uh, reduce infection and uh, the sterilization and cleaning processes for instruments uh, is very involved, so much so that for most of the operations that I would do, a large quantity of the, of the instruments are disposable. They're thrown away at the end and new ones uh, are brought for the next operation. Um, it, it's an expensive way of doing things um, and also there are some quality implications because it's something that's used, a scalpel that's used once to be thrown away at the end uh, isn't anything like as good um, as an old-fashioned metal one. And we use an awful lot of different, different instruments. This is just, uh, this is a subset of the instruments that we use. So when we do a, just a conventional triple bypass operation, these are the instruments that we would have available just to take the vein from the leg. These are, this is not the big tray that we would use for opening the chest. So there's a vast amount, and some of these, um, uh, a lot of the clamps um, are reusable, and we have big issues because we know that, particularly with prion disease, that some of the sterilization um, modes are not entirely effective. So there are, when, when we operate on a patient who may have a condition that we're not familiar with, 30,000 pounds worth of instruments has to go into storage until either the patient is confirmed as not infected or we come up with a better way of sterilizing them. So if we had a system whereby my theater list goes out at about 5 o'clock uh, the day before I operate, if the next morning, overnight, all the instruments had been 3D printed and run through a sterilizer, so they were all brand new and fresh to my specification, that would be a major advance. And for me, part of the hospital of the future, the ability to print things you need so that I'm not um, uh, left without equipment or things haven't been sterilized so I can't get hold of them and I have to delay operations. And even simple things like um, scalpel blades, um, there are all sorts of materials, including ceramics now, that we can make these out of. Um, and we can make them to a very high quality, 3D print them, and then dispose of them at the end of the case. I won't go into any detail about the robotic instruments because we've talked about that before. But basically, once you have, um, once you have a, a force feedback capable robot that you can start to do safe operations inside the body, there is really is no limit to what you can do in terms of designing the instruments so that they can uh, replicate whatever operation you want on the outside. Um, and again, it comes back to being able to describe what you want. If you um, can get a, the, the surgeon or the physician to tell you what they want in a language that you understand, this is unambiguous. Um, I don't have to use words to describe this. I want to make a device that's got a spike on it that sticks into the tumor, and when I close it, the teeth grab, capture a piece 
of the cancer so I can take a remote biopsy. This is why the language is so useful to us. Um, artificial life support um, is something that's becoming massively prevalent. Uh, we run a, a, one of the national services um, for both heart and lungs, and you can see this is going off the scale. So what happens is uh, we take um, patients where they've had catastrophic failure of the heart, um, or the lungs, or both, um, to the point where they're on intensive care, they're receiving all the treatment and the drugs that we currently have, and they're still not able to survive. So we take a modified bypass machine, which is this device here, and we plumb it into the patient and we take over the job of their circulation, um, and then we're going to have a cup of tea while we think about what's wrong with them. And the whole idea is this, this is not a treatment, this just buys you time. It stops the clock um, until you've either recovered or we've worked out what's wrong. But again, it's technology intensive and we again have one size fits all. So someone my size, we will still use the same pump as someone uh, who may be uh, 45 kilos. So one of the problems that we have with this is that we have um, very limited ways of connecting it to the patient. So we normally put it into big arteries and veins, either in the groin or the arm, occasionally the neck, or sometimes directly into the heart. Um, and the pipes that we put in Again, there's an opportunity there to be able to 3D print them, custom built to the anatomy of the patient. So they're big enough to flow enough blood, but not too big that they cause blockage or damage when you take them out. And I think that um, that would be a much more useful um, use of 3D printing and anatomical scans rather than printing me a picture of the arteries. If you could print me a cannula that I could put straight in, that would be of great use to me. Um, it is mainstream. We've been providing ECMO uh, and have successfully rescued some patients um, from both London and Brighton Marathon. Um, so it's something that we're using not only in hospitals but outside. We've even explored the possibilities of making the pump um, uh, more compact by using 3D printing because ultimately um, the technology that we carry is large. If we had something that was small and scaled down and we could travel, it would be really useful. I talked about the pipes. Um, there, there's a whole world of innovation waiting to happen here because at the moment uh, we put a very big pipe in through the neck sometimes and it's got a series of holes in it. I want to drain blood coming back to the heart from these two pipes so it's got a hole up at the top and a hole down the bottom which drains the blood outwards. It then goes through the pump that you saw in the previous picture, goes back in. This time the nasty carbon dioxide has been removed, the good oxygen has been added so the job of the <coughs> lungs has been done <coughs> and the nice blood is then pumped down through this into the heart again we have all sorts of different anatomical shapes and sizes of people but we have basically one pipe that fits all and sometimes it works like a dream but sometimes it's a real nightmare so again if we were able to um, take a scan of the patient and have a pipe printed that, that, that was perfectly designed we could guarantee to have excellent flow and a much higher chance of saving these patients. You could go a step further and say, well, hang on a minute. You know, it, is it possible within the structure of the pipe to have a, a series of tiny pumps that do the job of pumping the blood and taking the carbon dioxide and adding the oxygen? Then you don't even need to take the blood outside the patient. You just put a high-tech device inside the patient that does the job for them. These are all real-world things that would help me today or tomorrow if we had them. But the biggest one of all is detecting decline. There is no question that for every pound we spend treating someone who's got a condition, um, <coughs> it is a, on average about 12 times more expensive than trying to prevent the person having the disease in the first place. At the moment, we have a model that's slightly strange where I do um, a heart operation, it goes very well, the patient stays in hospital five days, and we monitor them to make sure they don't fall off their perch. If they're going, doing well, they go home and then they come back and see me in six weeks' time to see if they've survived. We call it outpatients, but basically, <coughs> we don't monitor, monitor them at all after they've left hospital, and then they come back at the end, and then we sign them off. Likewise, in hospital, um, we have patients and we monitor blood pressure, heart rate, all the usual things. Um, and if the blood pressure disappears or the heart stops, then we call the cardiac arrest team and they come rushing. 
we need to do this differently. We need to be detecting decline. We need to be using technology to predict when events are going to happen. It's not good enough to wait until the event happens and then try and undo it. Um, we've got access to all sorts of really clever scanning. Most people are wearing some wearable technology. And there's a big push um, from NHS Innovations uh, that we've been asked to lead on to try and come up with a solution whereby both in hospital and ultimately out in the community, people have some ability to measure the parameters and use AI and deep learning. And we have some partners for that so that um, we can try and predict when trouble's going to happen and get in there before the problem has happened. I have a bit of an issue at the moment, as some of my colleagues will know, is that we have access to really good machine learning, but the problem is we're not looking at the right things. Um, and to give you an analogy, uh, let's say we're looking to detect when accidents have happened. So we use smoke and flames to detect a crash, and that works very well. And if we make the smoke and flame detector very sensitive, we can get closer and closer to the point where the accident happens. But with the smoke and flame detector, we are never going to be able to detect when the accident is about to happen. It doesn't, they're the wrong metrics. Those are things that happen afterwards. And many of the things we're measuring today are the wrong things. So we need not more artificial intelligence. We need better sensing. Um, we need things from uh, the wearable technology. We need things from the environment. We need to scan the patient's temperature. Um, we can uh, infer all sorts of things from the differential temperature from head to toe, people's responses, how their voice sounds. There's all sorts of metrics. Um, and the Americans have given us a great uh, term for those things that rather than wear on the outside, we, we ingest. Uh, they're called innables. So these are things that can speak uh, to the outside world through some form of Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, near field connection. Uh, and you swallow them, they travel through the gastrointestinal tract, or you can have them implanted under the skin. And they relay information from inside the body that you wouldn't otherwise be able to get. And the idea is we gather all this data together, um, and the AI looks at it. And in the first instance, we, we apply the technology to, to, uh, to patients um, where there's a high event rate. So patients in heart and lung hospitals where things go wrong so that we can tell the computer, these people became unwell. Can you look and tell me from all this uh, information um, if there was any trend that you can see? And can you predict who will deteriorate next? So in terms of innovation and 3D technology, there's a wealth of things that we need to do. We need to have the patients fully wired up so that, they can, um, so that we can detect decline in them before it happens, but also not make them immobile, allow them to get up and move around the hospital. So I, I, I'm very keen that, that we don't have a, a, a distracted, disseminated group of different things, that it's all part of the hospital of the future. And I would go a step further. Uh, I, I don't want to talk about robotics. We talked about that last time. But one of the things that um, we have seen at several of the shows now is holographic technology is coming of age. And not only um, can we use it to create 3D models instantly, so you don't have to wait for them to print, and you can change the design of them. Um, but also, you can potentially um, create uh, environments using uh, holographic printing, so that you can really uh, change the specification and the design of the hospital of the future. So I see a, I see a place um, in the future where patients come into the hospital, and the hospital adapts to suit their needs. So if there's a major incident, it adapts uh, to deal with the high volume of customers, um, where all the equipment that is necessary is 3D printed. And if you think surgical instruments are, you know, are jumping in the deep end, well, we're a heart and lung hospital. You know, we listen to every patient's heart with a stethoscope. We don't have stethoscopes at the end of every bedside. So there's a process of cleaning them, which is very tedious. You know, if we had the capability of producing high quality stethoscopes um, so that we could just examine patients, you know, that would be a start. So the idea is you come into the hospital, the hospital is configured for the needs of the patient, the equipment is 3D printed, ready for you, so it's clean and sterile and to your specification. But also, in your journey through the hospital, probably while you're waiting to come in and afterwards, we have technology in place to detect decline so that we can say, hold on, I think something's going wrong, we need you to come in, or we need to do something to prevent decline. So. That's what I want to do um, in the hospital of the future. 
In terms of the technology, this is the team uh, that we, this is one of the teams that goes out to collect the sick patients, and we've got a custom-built trolley, um, which is a, a project underway. All of this is conventional heavy ITU machinery. All this needs to change as well. This needs to be redesigned for purpose. We've got um, ventilators that are highly complicated, syringe drivers that um, are, are, I mean, that's the active component. It's the syringe itself, and it's connected to a huge thing. We, we, we need to look at all of the things in a joined up way um, so that we can get rid of this and have something that is fit for purpose. I think if you want to get really technical, you can start to go right down to the sort of molecular level um, because if you're able to shift more oxygen in the blood, you wouldn't need to pump more blood around the body. As long as you get more blood flow, as long as you get more oxygen, it doesn't matter how you get it there. So I think you can start as simple as a stethoscope through to sort of molecular and submolecular um, innovation. But ultimately, it has to be joined up and it really needs to be thought about as the hospital of the future where the engineers and the doctors and the scientists and the medics all need to sit down, talk a common language and decide ultimately how they're going to use this technology to help the patients. Um, I think I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much.